We'll get back into our teaching series on the book of Matthew. We will get back into Romans probably a little bit in the next couple of weeks, but I still want to finish off some of Romans, I mean, some of Matthew for us, because we're entering into that third part of our um, vision, if you want to call it. I want to call it a vision, just who we are, gospel-centered, Christ-focused, and mission-determined. That's who we are. And so for five years, we've laid that foundation of the first two And now we really believe as as leadership in the church, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that it's time for us to step out now. It's time we've consolidated our foundations. We've built our our basic understanding of of the gospel and of Jesus, looking through Mark and, and Judges and all those books in the Old Testament and the New to understand who Jesus is and what he calls us to. And now we need to move into that section of mission determined. What does that look like as we move outward? We've been looking inward for a long time. It's time for us to start looking outward. And so where we are this morning in the book of Matthew is one of those passages I often say to you, I preach through books so that I cannot hide from the things that cause division. Those things that cause us sometimes to argue with each other. And this is one of those passages, Matthew chapter 10, that has caused much division, much arguing, much discussion, um, some of it good, some of it not so good, because it has divided us between what I would call the conservative reformed church and what we would call charismatic churches. And you know my feeling that all churches should be charismatic because we should all be operating in the gifts. Every single one of us. If you're a Christian, sadly for us as Baptists, we like to have Father and Son and hide the Holy Spirit in the cupboard. We can't do that. As Christians, we've got to allow Him the freedom to operate in us so that our gifts are displayed for the edification of the church. If we're not operating in our gifts, the church is losing out. I've said to her so many times, if you don't come to church and exercise your gift, you are robbing me of blessing. Because your gift is to bless me and my gift is to bless you. So we need to be operating in the gift. So I've stressed, let's not argue about the charismatic churches. Because we should be charismatic. Chadas, gift, grace. We should be. It's the problem is that for many they've taken that too far and become hyper charismatic. And that's caused the problem because their theology is not sound. You cannot be charismatic without sound doctrine. That is the problem that many of these churches do have. And sadly, when they do teach their stuff, they don't teach it from a basic understanding of the gospel and from an understanding of scripture. And I believe at at Yad Westray, we're trying to do that. Foundation is solid. So that when we operate and exercise our gifts, we do it right. We don't do it that it causes disruption or disharmony or disgrace for the church, because I believe many have caused a disgrace to the church and to the gospel. And so this passage has some stuff in it that has caused that division. I've argued with friends of mine around this passage. They are in the hyper-charismatic Pentecostal kind of churches, and it's caused issues. He loves the Lord Jesus, but I think there's a little bit of confusion on some of the outworkings that need to be looked at. So the passage we're going to look at, I know when I'm finished, I was saying to Chad this morning, we were having some coffee, some guys are going to come to me afterwards and want to fight with me. Please don't. (laughs) Let's just look at the passage, see what it says, and move on from there. So it's not a sermon like you got last week. Last week was a little bit more of my personal journey through um, sabbatical, but it had the same theme that we're going to be going through. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Wherever that is, whatever you ask me to do, send me to do that. And so where we are now in the book of Matthew, it's about three weeks ago, um, Sue shared around the end of chapter 9 of Matthew. Can you remember that? Can you, can you go back that far in your, in your minds? The cast sheep. The cast sheep, yes. So Jesus is moving through the villages and he's going through the synagogues and he's preaching and teaching within the synagogues. That's the first clue we need to hold on to as we go into Matthew 10. He's not just walking through the villages, talking to everybody. He's in the synagogues teaching to the Jews. Then comes this understanding. He looks at them and he sees that they are helpless and hopeless. Without a leader, they are harassed. He's talking very specifically about the Jews. We've got to keep that in mind because that clears up a lot of the, the problems in the next part. And he says to the disciples then, as he's looking at them, he says to them, look around you. The harvest is here. The harvest is ripe. But who are we going to send out? 
And the word there actually isn't to send. The word there actually is to hurl. What he's saying is we're not just going to send them here. We're going to hurl them out at our people to teach the truth of Jesus. And so that's where chapter 9 ends off. And it leads straight into chapter 10. The greatness and the goodness of God. He's asking a question, but he's already solving the problem. Who are we going to send? Oh, hold on. Yes, 12 guys that I can send straight away. So the next part leads in. So let's read from chapter 10. We're only going to go up to verse 10 because that is really the key of this passage. He, that is Jesus, called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. This passage has caused division amongst Christians. And I fully, one of the, I have two favorite words. I know you always think my favorite word is therefore. Can you remember the other one? No, not that, Sean. Context. Whenever we read scripture, we must understand the context to know what is being taught. Otherwise, we could go anywhere and do whatever we want to. And that's what's happened. Let's take this verse out. By his stripes we are healed. So that means everybody must be healed. That's not what it says. It says our iniquities, our sin was upon Jesus, and by his stripes we have been healed. Not physically, but of sin. So we cannot teach Jesus heals everybody because there's a lot of people he didn't. So we've got to get the context, the whole context of Isaiah 53 is Jesus, not healing. So we must talk about Jesus. So when we get here, we must talk about what is Jesus actually saying to these 12 guys that he's sending out. So we begin first with, he calls his disciples to him. We are disciples. What does that actually mean? Not yet. You're getting there. Melissa's on the ball. She's keen. (laughs) Disciples mean we are still following and we are still learning. So these disciples have been walking with Jesus all this time and he's been teaching and equipping. They've been watching on-job training, best training ever. Watching Jesus, seeing what he's doing, seeing how he's doing these miracles, watching this great Jesus just do some, and he's just this ordinary guy walking amongst people, doing incredible miracles. The time has come, though, for them to step up. The time of learning is over. And so he says to them, he calls his 12 disciples to them, to him, and he gives them authority. So what he's done now is he's taken, if we go back to Matthew or go forward to Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me. Now you go. What he's actually saying is, I'm now passing my authority to you to do what I have been doing. So he's saying to them, Yana, is that right? English, doesn't matter. He's saying to them, you are disciples who have been learning, but now my authority, in a way my mantle, is passing to you now. Now you need to go. Look, the harvest field is full. I've just asked you, who can I send? Well, I found the answer. There's 12 of you. Off you go. So they now move from disciple to apostle. That is key for us to understand what their ministry really is. And for me, we've got a lot of new people in the church. So I need to just give you what we understand about apostolic ministry. There are no apostles today. I cannot say that any simpler. There are no apostles today. These were them. And it finished with them. We have apostolic ministry. Big difference. So one of my gifts is apostolic ministry. Well, how does that work out in our church today? It means there's this gift of seeing where the struggles are, where the problems are, to give good leadership. That's what apostles do. 
These apostles, the word apostle actually says to be called out as a messenger, sent as an ambassador. So these guys went from learners to apostles, messengers of God with his message and his message only. Listen to the apostles of today. There's every message but Jesus's. They make up a whole lot of stuff. Doom, eat grass. What nonsense. And they call themselves apostles with God's message. So if somebody comes to you today and says, I'm Apostle Bob, as I always say, run away very quickly because he's going to lead you astray. <laughs> At least Megan's listening. <laughs> so let me get back where Megan, my train of thought is gone now. So we have these apostles which are bringing God's message and only his message. That's it. So again, there are no apostles today. Apostles were those who were personally commissioned by Jesus himself. Was Matthias an apostle? Was Matthias mentioned here? No. So we've got to even get that understand. When the, when the disciples elected Matthias to become one of them, because Judas had gone after he betrayed Jesus, who appointed Matthias? The disciples. So we don't see him as an apostle because he wasn't appointed by Jesus himself. Paul was considered an apostle because he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, commissioned by Jesus himself. I can guarantee you all the apostles today weren't commissioned by Jesus himself. They were commissioned by delusions of grandeur, and I think maybe even by connecting with the wrong deity, if I will use that term, because they're sending out a message that is false and a message that is disruptive, disruptive and divisive within the church. There are no apostles today. It ended with these guys. And he says to them, I'm calling you to do what I'm asking you to do. I need you to go into the harvest field. Now we start hitting some of the problems. I'm not going to go through their names. You can catch up on those yourself. So they're going to go out, he says, with the authority to drive out evil, sorry, evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Let's not go there yet. We'll come back. Let's go down to verse 5, because here's where we start hitting the key. These 12 men Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Which men did he send out with these instructions? These 12. So we can't say, well, these instructions are for all of us. Because it said these 12. He sent very specifically these 12 apostles. You must go and do these things. And I think there's six, seven. Seven things. Three of them are, are what I would call primary instructions and four are secondary instructions. Okay, got that in your head. Three are primary, four are secondary. So he says to these 12, I am sending you out as my apostles, as my messengers to talk to who? The lost sheep of Israel. Do not go to the Gentiles or any town of the Samaritans. Jesus is very specific to these 12. Do not go near the Gentiles. First, remember when we went through Romans? First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. First, the message is first to the people of God, the people of Israel, to hear who Jesus is and to accept him. We know what happens in the story that they didn't. Praise God. Because that's why we are here. But the first calling was for these 12 only to go to the Jews, don't touch the Gentiles, and please don't go to the Samaritans. Not because Jesus didn't like the Samaritans. Because they'd already seen Jesus working with the Samaritans, it would have been too easy. Because they would have had already a record of Jesus doing incredible things. So he's saying, I want you to go to the synagogues. I want you to go to the Jews who are going to be hard. It's reckoned to be one of the most atheistic countries in the world today. The Jews. God's chosen people. He says, I want you to go to them first. And I want you to share a very specific message. Keep this in the back of your mind. To the Jews. Okay? What does he tell them to go and teach? 
as you go, preach this message. Ron's reading ahead of us. Preach the kingdom of heaven is near. That's what he says to them. Go and teach this. Not this other stuff. We'll get to the reason why now. Go and preach the kingdom of heaven is near. Where have we heard that before? Can you remember a while back? Matthew chapter 3. The strange guy comes out of the wilderness. He's got honey dripping off his beard. His clothes are tatty. His hair's wild. Looks like he's gone through the tumble dryer. He comes out of the wilderness, and what is his message? Very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's, that's all Jesus says to them. He doesn't tell them, do all this other stuff. Preach, the kingdom of heaven is near. Salvation is at hand. Jesus is near. That's, that's what he calls them to. We add all the other stuff on top of that. We'll get to what we actually call to just now. There's a lot of things we're parking. A very specific message, repent. We can take a slight detour there and say to us, well, we are still called to repentance. Just because you're speaking to the Jews doesn't mean we don't have to repent. Acknowledge your sin, mourn your sin, confess your sin, and then confess Christ. It's very simple. We make it very complicated. We are sinners. Acknowledge that. Mourn it. Because sin separates us from God and often from each other. And I can tell you that those who call themselves apostles are separated from us today. Because what they are and who they are is sinful. We should be praying for them. That God would open their eyes. We confess our sin and then we confess Christ. That's what he, he's saying to them. He was saying to th that to them on the side of the river. Repent. Come before the Lord and acknowledge who he is. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus has arrived. Salvation is here for you. That is the message they were supposed <coughs> sorry, to preach. Then this other stuff starts coming into place. Let's read that. So he's preaching. He wants them to go and preach. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Now, the problem with the hyper-charismatic prosperity gospel NAR teachers like Joel Osteen and, and that chap from Bethel, Bill Johnson, thank you. All these guys, Jesse Duplantis, um, Joyce Meyer, all these people hone in on these four. See, they're not, they're not preaching the kingdom of heaven is near. They're not preaching repentance. They're preaching supernatural miraculous gifting. So when they come into the church, their whole kind of sermon is to lead to this. That they can raise the dead. I haven't seen any of them do that, strangely. Heal the sick. Heal those of leprosy. Cast out demons. Now, why is that there? See, we've got to find the context of why. He's not saying to them, go and do that. He's telling them to preach the kingdom. But we know that when Jesus was operating in his ministry, what was happening? This was happening. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He healed those from leprosy. He cast out demons. He was revealing his authority to the people. So, this, these four things are a revelation of God's authority through them. So they're still going to happen. We go back to when um, John sends a message from prison. What is the question he asks? Are you really the one we've been waiting for? What he's really saying, have everything I've done, I'm sitting in jail, he's beheaded a little while later, everything I've done, has it been in vain? And what is the answer that, what is the answer Jesus sends back? Look around you. The dead have been raised. The sick have been healed. Those with leprosy have been healed. Demons have been cast out. And John says, hallelujah. revelation of Jesus' authority. So now, for them, when they go out and begin to preach, what is going to happen? They're going to come into places where people are going to say, we don't know this Jesus. Who is that? Remember, they're Jews. In a way, they're living under the bondage of the law. And they can't get out of that. And so they come preaching this new message of repentance. The kingdom of heaven is near. And when they begin to preach, these things begin to happen. The sick are healed. They start to pray. I can tell you these gifts still work today because I've prayed for a sick baby who was dying on Friday. When I saw him on Sunday, he was walking around. 
That doesn't mean I've done anything. That's a, I would always say revelation, an authenticating of who we're actually dealing with. Not I, but Christ within me. We sang that. And so people get healed. Have I cast out demons? Yes. Have I seen demons? Yes. Am I terrified of them? Yes. Because they're not people to, I shouldn't say people, beings to trifle with. Because they are far bigger and far more supernatural than we are. I've had many people say, ah, demons don't exist. Man. Devil's best weapon to tell you that he doesn't exist. Those of you who know military things, if you don't know your enemy, you're in trouble. We don't preach the enemy, but we know the enemy. People say, ah, Barry, there's no demons. I've walked into a house where I was called to do a cleansing. I might have shared with you already. I can't remember. I opened the front door. They said something's been in our house. Oregon pine, beautiful floors. And there's burnt footprints, claw marks right up the passage to the room where they told me something was there. Go and tell me demons don't exist. Seeing the evidence. We can see it sometimes in people. Look at the, you're going to see, look at their eyes. I can tell you, go and watch TV. I'd spend some time this week quickly just running through, just to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Go and watch a clip of Joel Austin. Look at his, oh, he can't normally see his eyes because his eyes are closed. Go and look at Kenneth Copeland. Look at his face. There's nothing there. And all those guys that follow that teaching are stuck in this because it's all about them. It's all about them. And what are they doing with it? Making money. So they don't come and preach the gospel. They preach a version of the gospel. And the version of their gospel is what the NAR call, NAR for you don't know, is the New Apostolic Reformation. It's a new kind of thing that all of those guys belong to. That we are God's. That's their theology. We are little gods. They've dropped the little now. They just say, now we are gods. And we can do all things. It's a lie from the devil himself. And people are following it. By the, we have a little church like this. Go and preach this nonsense and see how quickly we'll grow. Because everybody wants to hear how great we are and how good it's going to be. They don't want to hear the word of God that convicts us to repentance and confession. And so Jesus sends them now and says, I want you to go and preach that the kingdom is near and these things will happen, but please don't focus on them. Don't focus on these because all they do is disrupt what is going on. We could start now and have people rolling around on the floor and laughing and giggling and trying to fly and do all sorts of stuff. Disrupts from the preaching of God's word. And that's all it is. So when somebody starts laughing and giggling hysterically, do you listen to me or do you watch them? We all watch them. And God's word, some hear it, but it's just a distraction. God says, please, just preach the kingdom is near. For us, what does God say to us? If you want to say, but I have to preach these things because God said I must, then you must be an apostle. Now we already got a problem because there aren't any. So you've got a delusion already. But who did he send them to? To the Jews. So if you're going to say to me, but Barry, I should be healing the sick and I should be raising the dead, then go and do it to the Jews. Don't do it, yeah? Because you can't take half the calling. you either got to take all the calling, all the command, or none of it. So we take all the calling. Okay, we better all pack up and go to the Jews. Go find a synagogue down the road and go start preaching the gospel. Oh, sorry, we can't. We should be preaching the kingdom. See, we need to get context of what is right here. We are called. So remember, all of this is happening pre-resurrection. This is pre-cross, pre-resurrection. We are commissioned as Christians, as the Gentiles, post-cross. So that our calling is different. So our calling, Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me, so go and preach, go and teach, go and, go and make, con not converts, go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, just like John was doing, and teach them what I've commanded you. Teach them what I've commanded you. All I can say is we've got to go back to Acts chapter 2. The apostles were devoted, or they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Where's the apostles' teaching today? Yeah. This is it. So this is what we teach disciples. When we bring people into the church. If you've come to this church as a visitor to hear a message that's going to make you feel good and make you wealthy, you're in the wrong church. Amen. Yeah, we preach God's word. 
and it convicts us and it deals with us. So, I keep losing track of myself. So I call him. You can see when I, when I haven't got notes, God seems to be doing something with me. Just say, speak from your heart. We are called in Matthew 28. That is our calling. But added to that calling, that's not to the Jews, going to all the world. In other words, Jew, Gentile, race, creed, color, makes no difference. Go everywhere and make disciples. These guys were called only to the Jews. Then we get through right to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. Wait there for me. The power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria, and the ends of the earth. Kabiga, Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and the ends of the earth. That is our calling. So we need to hold that to ourselves. I am not called to go and do all these other things. I am called to make disciples. And how do I make disciples? I share the gospel. I preach the word. And, and the, the really great joy about that is, once I do it, he does the rest. I can preach to you all day and you won't get saved. But let Jesus just touch your life. And you're saved. Yeah. I've written on my board. I'm trying to think what I wrote there. The act, the command of salvation is not for us. We are the witnesses to salvation. We cannot save people. We witness to our salvation. When Jesus said, you will do miracles greater than mine, he wasn't talking about heal the sick and raise the dead. He was saying, you're going to share me and people will be saved. If you've ever shared the gospel with somebody and watched the light come on in their eyes, it is the most satisfying feeling you will ever have. That they saw the truth of Christ. That is our calling. Go and make disciples and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That is a much broader calling than these guys got. So we can't be saying that this calling is for us. This is a calling to the apostles to go to the Jews. We have the benefits of this calling. That's the great thing. Because when we go into places and we begin to preach the gospel, these things happen. So we start to, why do you think in this church we call people up to pray for healing? Because we're not cessationists. We don't believe the gifts have stopped. We believe we practice them. So if you're sick, we pray for you. If you've got leprosy, today we could say if you've got cancer, we will pray for you. If you've got demonic influence, we will pray for you. I don't know if you, if you, I'm going to raise you from the dead because then you wouldn't be here. I got to go and listen to a guy. I was invited, just off the top of my head, I was invited to a speaker in East London by the name of Surprese Satole. Supposedly it raised over 3,000 people from the dead. Strangely, I never heard of it. Because I think we should hear about that. I think CNN and Fox would all be there in there. Works in a ministry in northern Mozambique called Iris Ministry. Some of you will know it. With Heidi Baker. It's all about supernatural stuff. Very little gospel. I went to a talk of his. When he started to talk, that crowd in the corner started rolling and laughing. Distraction. We listened to him teach out of, I think it's in Acts, where Paul sits under Gamaliel's teaching. Biggest lot of nonsense. That my associate pastor, Sia Bulela, said to me, I think we should have coffee. So we got up and walked out. If you're going to teach, teach the word. Don't teach your own stuff. And I, I, I want to see the people you raised from the dead. Because raising people from the dead is not about you. It's about authenticating the message. So I love calling people up to pray. If you're sick, come here. Let's anoint you with oil because the scriptures tell us to do it. If we're going to be a Bible-based church, we do what the Bible says. So we will pray for the sick. We should be doing it more. I don't think we do it enough. We should be praying for all these things more often, exercising our gifts within this church, because I'm sure there might be some city here who've got the gift of healing or praying for healing. So we are called to the world to preach the gospel. There's a very key line here. The next, after looking at these, so those four are the secondaries. Three primaries, go to the Jews, preach the kingdom of heaven is near, and then we're going to come to the third primary now, which is the struggle for the prosperity gospel churches. Freely you have received, now freely give. 
Oh, that's a problem for some. We have been saved by grace. The gospel and the death of Jesus was not free. It came at a huge cost. It cost God his son. It cost Jesus his life. So in a way, we shouldn't say grace is free because it was bought at a terrible cost. But we get it free. The gift of life is a gift of God. So the grace and the gospel is God's gift to us. And then we have you saying, I want you to go. You freely received my teaching. You freely received who I am in your lives. Now go and give it to others. When you walk into our church, I don't know if you've seen it. Can you remember what it says on the left wall? Blessed to be a blessing. It's not about us. It's about receiving the grace of God and passing the grace out. We can't keep it for us. So many of the guys who are preaching God's word and holding on to these four secondaries don't like this line. Because if you want me to pray for me, you better put 100 bucks in the little white box. Because that's how they work. If you want to be wealthy, you better put some in. Interestingly, that sum doesn't go to the church much. Seems to go to buy new airplanes and fancy suits. Freely give what you have received. Now you might say, well, Barry, you, you get a salary. Yes, I do. But right at the end, it says a workman should be looked after. So, yes, pastors get paid. Missionaries go out. We should be supporting missionaries. Somebody's going because a lot of us aren't. So we support them in their ministry so that they can go for us. You freely receive, now freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or an extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. One key thing I get out of there, if you're called to work for God, you better be working. You better be working. Don't just sit in your office and do squat for the week and then come talk nonsense in the front. You've got to put the work in. You've got to put the hours in to preach a solid message. I can tell you, guys who preach scripture take sometimes two to three days for a 30-minute message to study what it really is saying. So he's saying to them, this is the third primary. First primary, can you remember? Go to the Jews. Second primary, preach the kingdom. Third primary, I will look after you. Go, I will look after you. Doesn't mean it's always going to be good. Doesn't mean it's always going to be great. Doesn't mean there's not going to be times where you're going to be walking barefoot or you're going to be hungry. But I will be with you always. Matthew 28. That's what he's saying to them Yeah, Don't take the stuff you need with you. I will look after you. He was really looking at the distractions to come away from them. He was also saying to them, I want you to go and you better go now. Remember the rich young ruler, hold on, I'll follow you. But let me go check out my dad quickly. And what did Jesus say to him? You missed it. The guy sitting on the beach, Jesus came to him and said, I'm going to make you fishes of men, let's go. They put their nets down and they walked. Same thing here. He's saying to them, don't go home and get your, your money bag. Don't go home and get another shirt. Don't go and get your sand. Just go. And I will provide for you. When Donna and I started out our trip as missionaries, the it wasn't easy, but we never lacked for anything. Never. We always had a house. We always had food. And our kids' bills were always paid for schooling and that. God looked after us. But I believe God looks after us when we preach the word. These other guys are being looked after very, very well. But not by Jesus. The people they are under. Their new masters. So when we look at this passage... I think we need to get in the right context of what we are called to. Just as Jesus called them to preach him, so we are called to preach him. Don't worry about the other stuff. The other stuff will happen when it needs to happen. Mark has a, a saying called the pink fuzzy. Have you ever heard him say that? Something that sat with me for a long time. Often when we're preaching, we're trying to create that atmosphere. And then when people get saved, oh, we're all hallelujah. They didn't get saved by Jesus. They got saved by the emotion and by a great manipulator of the word. There was a church in East London over one month, 50,000 converts, 50,000 people. It's called the Days of Glory Conference. It's the River Church in East London. I want to ask you, 50,000 people get saved in one month, and there's an average of 400 churches in East London at any given time. Where are the new ones? 
Because they didn't all go to one church. What happened to the church? Nothing. Where are they? If every church, 50,000 people, I'm not going to do the maths. If out of that 50,000, some went to every church, we should have had new buildings. Because we wouldn't have coped. Because they were fed lies. False gospel. False teaching. And they got milk for their money. It's not what Jesus told us. And so as we as a church consider what mission determined really looks like, I think we need to understand that the key to being mission determined is the first two. Gospel-centered and Christ-focused. That's all he's asking of us. Go and make disciples. Be my witnesses wherever you go. Don't have to go far. You know, J. John says in his one thing, you don't have to go and look for Christians, non-Christians. They're everywhere. You know what the sad thing is? There's some sitting here today in our church because they've never come to a place of repentance and accepting Christ. They're living under an illusion that has been given to them by so many. There's only one way to be saved. That is through repentance and Jesus Christ coming into your life. You can work as long as you like. You can come to church as long as you like. You can go to cell as long as you like and still be lost. Preach the kingdom. Preach the gospel. And let Jesus do the rest. Don't look for the miraculous. Because if you look for it, you're going to find it. And it's going to distract you from what God actually called you to. Every one of us. When I look at your faces here, how many places of influence are we in? If you look around us. We have so many mission fields. The harvest is ripe. Whom shall I send? Well, yeah, we all sit. And I want to say with the emphasis, yeah, we all sit. Let somebody else do it. Here I am, Lord. Send someone else. Preach the gospel. Preach the kingdom. Let God provide for you and see him do great things. Let's, when you get this kind of stuff, into, take the charismatic, um, you know, I'm saying that, to this passage and explain it to them, what they're actually missing out. Because if they want these four, they've got to go to the Jews, they've got to preach the kingdom, and they've got to have no money. And I guarantee you, not one of them will agree with you. Preach the gospel in season and out of season. Make disciples and be his witnesses. Let's pray. Lord, I, I don't even know what to pray right now. All I ask, Lord, is that your message would be received. I pray that Heart of hearing ears would be opened. Hearts that have been hardened by so much in life would have been softened. Blind eyes seen. Maybe bitter tongues loosened. Unclean lips cleansed. Feet unbound to go. Hands released to serve. Lord, each one of us has gifts that you have given us. If we are a believer, if we are a child of God, then we have gifts that you have given to us. I pray you would make us a church that is excited in sharing and utilizing our gifts for each other so we can equip each other and, and encourage each other to be more than we are. Never once, though, thinking we're greater than we are. We are yours. And Lord, I pray that this church would serve you wholeheartedly. That as Ron said earlier on, we would be desperate for you. At every moment, every second, seeking you, even in the busyness of our lives, doing it to your glory and to your honor. Lord, I pray that even in Port Elizabeth, Westway would start becoming known as a church of the word. A church that is steadfast with the foundation of Jesus and the gospel. Not because the others are wrong, but because we want to honor you and serve you. And we want to do it properly. We want to do it right. I pray for your people that are sitting here this morning. Maybe some have been challenged. Maybe to think a little bit differently. Maybe others have been challenged to realize that without repentance and surrender to Christ, you cannot be saved. Maybe they're still stuck in works. 
Maybe for others, their, their fervor, their joy, their love for you, that, that first joy, that first love, has slowly got a little bit soured, maybe a little bit complacent. Maybe we just got comfortable. Revive each of us. Renew our spirits that we would be able to say, Lord, I'm going for you. Wherever, whenever, and however, Lord, give me opportunities to share you. And Lord, that might even be now over coffee to share Jesus. Lord, you are good and you are gracious. And thank you that we can call you Abba Father. We are your children. I pray that you would lead us and guide us on the road you want us to walk. And so as we go out now, Lord, this week into whatever we face, I do pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ would be upon us, that the love of God the Father would in, in a way cover us and watch over us, and we would walk in the power and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.